Coming up next, I would like to introduce Michael Stizinski and Mahesh Subramaniam, who will be presenting AI Data Center Networks. Michael is a senior project product manager at Juniper and is coming to us today from France. It's his second time presenting at Nanog. Mahesh is director of product management at Juniper. He's coming to us from the Bay Area and it's, I believe it's his first time presenting at Nanog. It's a pleasure to have them speaking with us today. By the way, Mark Johnson, it's a very interesting presentation and thanks a lot for inspiration and a lot of uh, insightful information starting from internet node to quantum physics. Thank you very much for that. By the way, I am Mahesh Subramaniam, uh, my colleague Mikkel from uh, Juniper Network uh, Data Center product team. And our main um, chatter there is to focus on uh, platform software uh, specifically into automated uh, secure data centers and also the main idea of our thing is to a data center fabric and in fact that is our main focus of the sessions too. So uh, to start with I would like to uh, make a kind of a statement here that if you talk about any 100 gig GPU clusters or even 1000, even 10,000, 32,000, the technology what we are going to uh, procure or we are going to adopt is Ethernet. Why? Because Ethernet is kind of a proven, everybody knows here, and also that there are two main reasons. Uh, with the latest data point, I checked it in the internet also, there are 600 million Ethernet switch ports has been deployed in last year uh, with multiple vendors, which means we have a strong multi-vendor capability in the Ethernet. The second is that strong interoperable capabilities. Because of the multi-vendor, there is no vendor lock-in. So the strong interoperable capabilities which Ethernet provides. Uh, that's what we are going to talk about now. And with that said, like uh, we want to talk about our different idea of architecture about a data center fabric. Also, we would like to share uh, in the globally, how we are solving the customer requirements in the AI data center perspective. That's what it's going to be. Thank you. So Ajanta going to be like, uh, we are going to talk about uh, DC data center network, existing workload, how it's going to differ from a data center network fabric. And, uh, and also that uh, we would like to uh, what is so, why is so special? Why it's now? Uh, that's the main topic going, we are going to discuss. And the second, we are going to talk about the life cycle of a model, right? And how DC data, data center network going to be useful in the life cycle of a training models, right? That's the second one. And the third one, we are going to talk about the different DC technologies, how we are going to connect the GPUs, how we are going to build the data center cluster, uh, connect together with the various type of connectivity. That's a going to be third topic. And fourth topic going to be key takeaway, what we learned and what we are working behind the story about a data center fabric. Okay, uh, I don't know, uh, in my different presentation and conference in Intel and Juniper, uh, the statement what I'm going to make now, it's going to be cliche, uh, bear with me, but it's very important. When you are going to design the data center, in my perspective, First, we need to understand the behavior of the workload. When I'm talking about the behavior of the workload, when we define the workload behavior, it will define the server requirement. When we define the server requirement, it will define the server connectivity. When we define the server connectivity, it will define the data center design requirement. Of course, that any data center workloads, whatever you're seeing in the 10 workloads here behind, everything going to use the claw architecture, right, leaf and spine, no changes. And it will be the same claw architecture. We are going to use it in even the 5G data center or in enterprise data center, of course, in the AI data center. Then what will be the different? That's the different we need to understand. That's an if, if you want to understand the difference, that means we need to understand the workload types. For example, if you're using an enterprise data center, 
mostly you will use the EVP and VXLAN because of multi tenancy. And also, you need to have a data center interconnectivity. You can use the VXLAN to VXLAN teaching. There are a lot of few requirements are required. On the same side, if you're talking about 5G data centers, there are 5G core component, also 5G ORAN component like ODU, OCU. If you're talking about OCU, if it is in the forage data center, that means the requirements are slightly different. If the forage data center with the OCU, you need a PTP sinky timing is very important in the data center switches. On the other hand, if you go talking about remote file DA, distributed X architecture for cable side, you need a dot one X requirement in the switch. So there are different different requirements. So we need to understand the behavior of the workload. When you're talking about the behavior of the workload, out of all these 10 different workloads, there are many, but uh, 10 to 12 years, most of the data center workload evolvement, there are many, I would say, like we pointed out around 10 here. Out of this 10, nine workloads other than A using same claw architecture, of course, but it is not, there are a lot of arithmetic calculation, but less CPU intensed. It's not highly CPU intense. That's a one difference. Second, this arithmetic, this all the nine workloads are not fully interdependent with the other component of the system. This is the key difference between other workloads, right? But when we're talking about AI workload, right? The AI workload, the, the, it's fully dependent with the system. That means the GPU has to communicate with other side of the GPU or inside the CPU sequence it has to be connected that is tightly coupled not loosely coupled the second there are petabyte of data intense arithmetic calculation going into the gp servers to train the model for that cp will not be enough you need some kind of a parallel processing and also you need a gpu or tpu that's tensor tensorflow processing unit or the general processing unit or graphical processing unit, anything you can say but you need a gpu or tpu than cpu that is one thing if, and what is the other key difference? Out of all these nine workloads, other than A workload, the payload is like a common EVP in VXLAN or IP fabric. But in A workload, that is so, that's easy actually. The only one workload we need to look into that, only one workload traffic type we need to look in, which is RDMA, which is a remote direct memory access, right? This is the key difference. And with that RDMA workload type, how it behaves and how we are going to connect that GPU cluster to move the memory chunk from one place to other place, that all we are going to see in the next few sessions. So this is so special because why it's now? That main question. The GPU is there for a long time. I would say like, like uh, six, eight, 10 years it's there, right? Why it's now? And that's the main question we need to solve. Uh, to do that, <laughs> Uh, I would say that uh, earlier there was a narrow AI and a narrow AI means you can see your home alert system. It will identify the person input output that will be sequential combinations. If it is uh, any human, it will give a ring alarm or it will give some alert. It's a dog or cat, something very simple narrow AI algorithms. And even the spam filter, you can see it in the email inbox, you will see it. But nowadays we are talking about Gen AI. This is this is also same algorithm, but it's a large language model or large video classification or, uh, or audio classification, we are doing it. In that, in Gen A, it depends upon whatever the input you are giving, it will calculate that it will understand the input and it will give the output accordingly. That's another Gen A evolvement given. And other one, then nowadays we are talking about domain specific A, that's domain A. And other one is the AJ. These are a lot of different different A models are coming in. It becomes so interest for this feature. And another one, I want to mention it that user interest. After the chat GPT-3, like a, one, one or two years back, the interest becomes so f intense, I would say, like a lot of people wants to know what it is. And the applications are real. When we are doing a, some calculation and competitive analysis on even some business requirement, there are 46 to 53 percent of CAGR improvement for this A network, which means the common annual growth rate, the investment the companies are putting together for A cluster is real. Uh, that's the reason we started working on two years back, and we're building a lot of fabric technology for the same, right? And also, 
the server uh, technology improved a lot. We are talking about the normal blade server. And also nowadays there is a DGX, HEX, H100, A100, different different servers, right? Not only that, and in the server inside, there is a PCIe bus, right? Right now the PCIe 5, it can go up to 30 GT per second, that is 30 giga transfer per second. And even PCIe 6, we are looking at around 64 giga uh, GT per second. This is huge improvement on how we are going to communicate inside the system. On the other hand, that is NMVE, the non-volatile memory express, that how you are moving the memory chunk from one place to other place in the flash memory. Even you have all your laptop and it's booting so fast. Why? Because solid state memory. And so this, the memory access has become so fast and the processing between the internal variable becomes so fast because of PCIe. So server evaluation also went so high. So it's the right time and this is the correct time to go into that training model and user interface are so high. So we started building a lot of traction, a lot of customer requirement, a lot of customer RFEs to how to build this cluster in my company. It can be starting from low end and it can go to high end also. Like what I mean is that it can be start with 50 GP cluster or it can go up to 1000 GP cluster, depends upon the customer requirement. You want to add anything in this? No, as a matter of fact, I think I, the, the, especially uh, the fact that users like the application side of things is, uh, is crucial here, right? We can have beautiful technologies, but as long as uh, there's no adoption on the user side, then it's not going to work. Uh, so just as an anecdote, uh, last week I was in, in Cannes in France at the AI conference, world conference, and uh, believe me guys, th th this is huge, right? The number of startups building applications around this topic is huge. So it drives also the networking side of things as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So that, that's why we wanted to bring this topic uh, during yeah. the NANA conference. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. This, uh, the, the last few slides, it's a literally staging slide. Uh, uh, we would like to uh, make sure that why it's so special and it's real and why it's now. And, but this is the main slide, I would say, like, how we are, why RDMA traffic, right? And uh, why we need a high radix switches? Why you need lossless fabric? That are the very important question. And to define, to justify those questions, we need to understand how this uh, large language models or uh, that uh, uh, the how uh, the training models works is very, very important. And as I said, the chat GPT-3 is the one of the main factor. There are a lot of uh, paradigm shift about our understanding, our interest in the, in the, in the whole industry about AA because of that chat GPT-3. So we'll take that chat GPT is one of the example. So you have a lot of data, raw data, maybe you can say the Wikipedia, or you can say it, take it in uh, stock exchange, a lot of data are coming together, right? The raw data, how it going to the training model. So what they will do, they will take the data, for example, chat GPT-3, they had taken about that raw data, and they tokenize the data, they will label the data. And there are a lot of encoding mechanisms are there, for example, byte pair encoding, one of the typical example. They will take the raw data, they will make it as a data set. The data set will become a token. Token is nothing but like kind of a sequence integers, like uh, for example, data center means data will be one token, center will be another token, data center will be the third token, like the combination that's a unique integer and that will go into the training model. <laughs> That's the reason you need a heavy lifting mathematical calculation or flops, the flop, uh, the floating point operations. So it is so intense, so we need a GPU for that. And this, they will take the raw data, again go to chat GPT-3, they are taken around, I uh, searched in internet, it's around 175 billion parameter going into the training model and it took 30 days to train the model and you know, they have used NVIDIA V100 server, around 10,000 GPU servers they used to train the model for 30 days. Likewise, if you talk about Llama, that uh, large language model Meta, I think they took around 21 days. I'm not sure, but may, I think they took around 21 days. So you need to take the data, you need to pre-process the data, and which means you need to make tokenize the data, and we need to give it to the GPU cluster. That's point one. And 
per gpu for example if you are talking about nvidia h100 that's the talk of the town it's per gpu will have 80 gb but i am talking about petabyte of data and how you are going to feed all the data into the one server it's not possible that means you need thousands of servers thousands of gpus to feed the petabyte of uh, data the parameters or tokens into the gpu to train the particular parameters to get the uh, the preferable outcome or whatever the outcome you need it that's what and if you have a thousands of gpus i mean hundred thousands of gpus or hundred thousands of gpus that means you have at least hundreds of servers per server right now as of, as i am standing now it's around eight gpus per server that's what nvidia providing it how you are going to connect those servers together you cannot put all the thousand or hundreds <laughs> servers in one rack right so you need multiple racks when you have multiple racks multiple servers automatically naturally the data center fabric is vital so how you are going to connect the one gp to other gp from another rack that's where the fabric coming to the picture and once it's trained the model the outcome we'll call it as a gradient and the gradient will be it will be propagated to another gpu as i said this a uh, uh, training or a cluster is sequentially connected if one piece of missing data outcome of the particular training you have to run the whole training again right we'll call it as a epoch or epoch or iteration there are a lot of different different jargons are there i am giving in the plain language if in the iteration in one particular job one of the thread or one of the token didn't do the calculation properly didn't transfer the rdmh memory chunk from one place to another place you couldn't transfer that means you need to run the job whole job again that means the chat gpt what i said you 30 days it will become 60 days or more than one year so the fabric lossless fabric is very important how you are moving a data from one place to other place without any congestion without any packet drop is crucial that's the reason the data center come into the picture it's not only stopping there the output of that particular uh, the training will go into the inference that's where the money is so wherever you are going to chat gpt3 you are typing in open ai that's inference that's what you are saying in the front end inference is not a very magic word it's very easy whatever the data center fabric you have wherever you are hosting the web servers and etc it's same thing right you are getting the output you are placing in front of the multiple users and they will log in they will subscribe and will get the money for it so training is kind of a capex and opex and uh, the inference is that's where you are getting monitoring all those things we are getting business go to the second one yeah thank you so this is again I, I, this is a very high level slide gathering the data train the data and put it in front of the users uh whom they use it right for example chat gpt open window you can open ai.com you can get that one that's inference so uh, go to the next slide so what i'm trying to mean here is that gathering the data that means you need a storage cluster training the data that means you need a training cluster and projecting the output you need a inference that means you need a inference cluster so whenever we are talking about ai data center fabric it's not only one type of training data center there are at least three to four different kind of a data center we are talking about one is the storage data center second is the training data center and third one is the inference data center sometimes in the inference they will use a shared pool storage data center as well and so there are four different kind of a data center we are talking about here and uh, go to the next slide this is kind of a, a high level view of the data center topology and if you are talking about storage inference and training data center cluster how you are going to connect the servers in the training cluster is very important because we already know how to solve the problem how to complete the use cases in the storage data center and we know how the inference cluster also will work because already we have a lot of data center we are hosting lot of web servers in that that's not an issue but in the training cluster is new how we are going to handle the rdma traffic how you are moving from memory chunk from uh, chunk from one place to other place with a lossless with a less uh, low latency i mean say low tail latency to complete the job so that is very important so so we are focusing only about training data center cluster 
the training data center cluster with available server connectivity now go to the next slide there are two types we can connect the servers into the data center one we are connecting all the eight gpus in the server to all the leaves that's point one or all the eight gpus in the server connecting to the one leaf not eight leaf so we will call it as a sod the stripe optimized design or we'll call it as a stripe unified design the stripe optimized design this is what in nvidia calling as a rail optimized design this is a lot of good advantage because the collectives will call it that uh, collectives means like when the training model is completed the gpu memory chunk will communicate each other within the server we'll call it as a nccl nickel on amd we'll call it as a rickle how it communicate each other within the server once it's completed that memory chunk information will go to the other server that's called collective communications how we are doing it with the optimized design if you notice properly in this diagram all the gpus from different different server will connect to the different leaves which means each gpu will connect with each leaf out of eight leaf if any failure happened the churn of the network will be high that's one of the disadvantage in the rail optimized design i would say the stripe optimized design the second right now it is eight gpu what about 16 gpu per server or 32 gpu per server that means your rack length will be high your optics connectivity will be optics connectivity will be different how it will different because that si the length of the for example sr4 you are using the optic connectivity for the short range for rack size is so high that means you mainly you to use vr vr sr4 or lr4 lot of different different optics you need to use it in the switch and also you have want to add anything about multi tenancy in fact yeah. so uh, in some situations multi tenancy may, may be uh, well optional uh, sometimes it's needed uh, in order to monetize on the infrastructure so uh, if we want to extend the multi tenancy from the uh, server itself to the network uh, there are different options one of the option is to leverage still the vpn uh, uh, vxlan using uh, a vpn route type 5 or the second option is to use some of the uh, traffic engineering uh, capabilities in order for example to isolate uh, uh, the large language models stripe to stripe communication from the rest of the of the tenants so for example we may have a situation where uh, a red tenant is very specific is using a lot of bandwidth and the flows he's generating are very long lived flows right so in this context we may be tempted to use some of the traffic engineering uh, yeah, mechanisms yeah, yeah that's true and uh, the another one is the stripe unified design right the blast rate is so high there because the every gpu on the particular server again eight gpus will connect to the only one leaf which means if leaves gone the server gone and that blast rate is so high but uh, in this one the network churn if the failure happens the churn will be less that's one of the advantage the optics different type of optics and is not required we know what optic we are going to use in the server specifically this kind of a design will be useful for like kind of a uh, if you have a high radix switches with the modular chassis yep. this kind of a uh, topology will be helpful what i mean is the high radix modular chassis few customers uh, specifically in i think in japan they want to use a modular chassis uh, and uh, for example uh, 576 400 gig port in one chassis and all the gpus will connect to the one particular product and that product uh, that means the gp to gp communication will be so fast and of course it will be lossless and that that kind of a, a advantage we have it which means if you are going with the, some kind of a domain specific 50 gpu cluster or 100 gpu clusters this kind of a topology will be useful or not the point and so to summarize this of course you know why we need a data center fabric for ai but the fabric the gpu how we are going to connect there are two parts one is that stripe unified design stripe optimized design there are pros and cons and depends upon what is your server and gpu cluster connectivity and uh, i want to summarize everything together because we talked about a lot of things and lot of jargons at the end the ai data center requirements are 
like we can talk it over uh, five parts. One is that you need a high radix switches. If you have a existing data center switches with a 25 gig or 100 gig will not work. I can confidently say that because the GPU servers, not like a CPU servers, the GPU servers, the NIC connectivity itself like a 400 gig. For example, NVIDIA DGX system having a CX7. The CX7 is the NIC itself with 400 gig. How you are going to connect the NIC into the leaf? That of course, by default, you need a 400 gig. So you need a high radix switches, like 64 into 400 gig, 64 into 800 gig, and some people even we are talk, uh, talking about 64 into one tera. So those kind of a high radix switches you require, that is the first requirement. The second requirement is the lossless fabric. That's what the whole session going to be. Next, Mikhail, you are going to talk about it. That the lossless fabric means, I told that it's a very sensitive RDMA traffic. It should not be any drop, even single drop, you need to run the job again, whole uh, training model again, the whole way. So you need a lossless fabric. How to achieve the lossless fabric? There are two ways you can achieve the lossless fabric. One is the efficient load balancing. Second is that congestion control, right? And efficient load balancing, there are different types like SLB, DLB, and now we are talking about GLB also. And the congestion control, of course, the famous one is the Rocky V2, uh, where you will talk about the PFC, ECN, how we can tweak it. Even we started working with the uh, different IETF uh, standards with the different vendors. And uh, we are coming with a lot of different, different ideas. One of the idea is the source flow control where uh, instead of using the PFC, we can use the source flow control dot one to, uh, I think, uh, QDW is one of the standard how you can understand the congestion and how we'll inf inform the congestion information to the source, slow down the traffic fl flow, and we need, there is a congestion is there, right? There are different, different methods we are going to see. I think next uh, half an hour, you are going to talk about those things, right? Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you, Mahesh. So uh, we've seen so far the architectural side. We've seen the uh, type of applications that we, we, we can run on the, on the backend network, on the front end. Uh, so far, you probably experienced mainly the front end part. And for the rest of the session, we'll focus on the, on the backend side of the, uh, of the architecture. So uh, speaking about the uh, RDMA workloads, uh, Mahesh mentioned that the speed of processing is key here. So you can see on the, on the diagram, uh, we don't have any kernel and the CPU uh, engaged in order to place the, uh, uh, m the data chunks on the wire, right? So we can directly process the chunks of data, put it on the, on the NIC card, and then send it to another server on the GPU side, right? So here is the example just of the communication between the two of the servers crossing the, uh, the spine devices. The topology itself is very simple. But obviously, the number of uh, the leaf devices inside the topology will depend on the, on the number of the GPUs that you have in your server or sometimes on something else, right? Uh, what, what is quite consistent is the speed of the connectivity. So we, you see on the diagram that it's a 400 gig connect, maybe 200 gig connect. So this is the perfect use case of where we see the 400 gig, 800 gig adoptions are really, really evolving very fast, comparing to what we've seen so far in traditional networks, right? The adoption of 400 gig is huge there. And of course, the number of ports of 400 gig uh, connect is, is growing uh, very, very fast. So uh, what, what you can see on the, on, on the slide is that these memory chunks, you can see on these uh, 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 red uh, blocks, uh, are moving across the network, but they are moving thanks to the transport, right? Specific transport. We can see on the diagram that uh, the transport is an ethernet on the outer side, but then we can see that it's an IP UDP, right? UDP with the specific destination UDP port, and then some random source UDP port, right? But if I have this uh, fixed uh, destination UDP port and some randomized uh, uh, source UDP port, uh, for some uh, uh, situations, we will see that it's not enough to efficiently load balance the traffic, and I'll cover that later on during this session as well. And then you can see the uh, InfiniBand the BTH header. That's the new stuff, which uh, uh, in case of uh, networking, uh, we can use in order to actually process uh, some of the information on the switch itself, and then uh, take uh, this information to load balance the traffic based on the uh, variations of the information inside the, the opcode, right? Like, for example, we can decide on which path to send the traffic based on the type of operations we are having, either the read, write, 
we can decide based on that uh, how to uh, how to in fact uh, process the data on the wire, right? I want on to add one point here. Go ahead. Um, this is very important one uh, about that uh, RDMA traffic, right? Whenever you just Google it even now, they will talk about elephant flows, right? Or jumbo frames. And uh, that is one thing to handle in the data center. The second is the less entropy, which means elephant flows with a less entropy. That is the biggest behavioral change compared to any other workload what you're seeing in the nine workloads. This in A and ML workload is 100% is RDMA memory chunk transfer. And in that, the RDMA traffic is like a like a like a elephant flows with a less entropy. How to identify the entropy here is that biggest challenge. Uh, that's what we are solving it here. So it yeah, means can I can have a single uh, source UDP, and then that session can stay like for a long time, right? It just sends the data data on and on and on for for weeks sometimes, uh, and it, it, it just it's a lot of bandwidth, right? So we need to dig into the packet and then uh, use something else than just the, uh, the transport UDP uh, layer to actually forward the packets efficiently across the network, right? So we can either take the, 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 the sequence numbers or uh, uh, the, the opcode values to, to take some uh, further decisions, right? So I, spec I, sp uh, I was talking about the read-write operations. So that's part of the uh, communication between the servers. Uh, and uh, what, what is important that before we put the, the data on the wire, uh, there is a, a, a negotiation of the session that will uh, take place. So you see that on the, on the top of the uh, session establishment uh, uh, summary diagram, where we actually <coughs> exchange the information on the Cooper values, right? The Cooper values from the client as well as from the server are exchanged, and then they are used at the transport level of the packet we've seen before, right? So that information is, uh, is, is crucial at the very beginning of the, of the session establishment. Then once the client and the server, they agree on the, these values, they can decide to, okay, but what about the memory information? Which regions on the, on the memory I will be using in order to uh, write the data to, right? So that, that's the second part of the, of the session establishment. And only then the data uh, transmission will happen, right? So, what you can realize on this diagram that there are acknowledgements, right? So the reliability of the, of the communication is maintained not at the UDP transport level, but at the RDMA level. So these uh, acts are coming at the upper level, right? From the RDMA uh, stack itself, right? So we have a guarantee that the memory chunks that I was showing will arrive uh, for the given session in a reliable way. And so once the, the job is terminated, there is obviously a, a, a graceful uh, uh, termination of the session, and we can see that at the bottom of the, of the, of the communication slide, right? So the state machine is pretty well defined. Uh, the communication is reliable. Uh, these are the, the main points to, to remember, right? And this, these Cooper values uh, are uh, randomly actually uh, initiated. It's like, a, think about this like a queue of, of the jobs that needs to happen between the server and the client, right? So that's, that's what we wanted to highlight. And then, okay, great, we have a transport part, which uh, is actually uh, the part where the data is being exchanged. But what if in our network, uh, there are some uh, problems in terms of entropy that Mahesh mentioned, right? Then in some situations, we need uh, some specific uh, uh, congestion management uh, inside the three-stage topology or five-stage. On the diagram, you have a five-stage IP cloud topology, and we see that uh, on the super spine two, there is a congestion point. The CP is a congestion point where the Rocky V2 data actually flows to the server in the other pod, in the pod two, but unfortunately, there are other type of communications which are congesting that link on the ET0 interface. So in that situation, we need to react on this, right? So uh, there are two options of uh, uh, managing such a situation. One is to simply uh, tag the packets uh, on the data side, uh, saying that the ECN explicit congestion notification uh, changes the state to uh, bits uh, values one one. And so the server four in the pod two will actually realize, okay, well, there is a, there is a problem we have. So I will inform the guy who is at the region of the traffic and uh, we'll ask him to slow down a little bit for a very short time in order to avoid the congestion on the, on the CP congestion point. So that's one option, right? And then once the reaction uh, happened on the server one, we realized that, okay, 
but sh should we also use in parallel the other uh, congestion man management mechanism, which is the uh, priority flow control, right? So the priority flow control is not something completely new. It existed even in the L2 Ethernet trunk uh, type of topologies. The new thing that we are using here is, is really that the uh, priority flow control uh, is set at the IP level. And so this is the second actually stage of notifying the originator of the data about the congestion. The reality is that sometimes you need to coordinate these two mechanisms. So uh, usually from the implementation perspective, it's the ECN that is uh, triggered first on the switch uh, and only then eventually the PFC. We may have also situations where only the ECN is used, right? The PFC cascade effect, you can see on the diagram where uh, uh, the super spine sends the PFC's packets down to the, to the origin in the, inside the, po the pod one. It's not something necessarily people like because uh, simply it just uh, slows down the other communications, yep. right? Yep. And in this context, the ECN is only used uh, uh, in, uh, in, the in the context where the, the, the PFC uh, pause frames will be triggered often. There are some mitigation mechanisms that we can highlight as well, where for example, uh, there, is a, there is a function called a PFC watchdog where we can simply ignore these, uh, these pushbacks sent in the pod one with the PFCs and then uh, resume the traffic uh, uh, immediately, right? But these two mechanisms, the PFC as well as ECN, they are the contributing factors for the situations where in fact that load balancing I'll be talking about is not so efficient, right? So uh, would you like to add anything on this? No, that yeah, handling this congestion is very important. Uh, how we are, one is that in AA traffic, avoid the congestion or control the congestion, right? Here we are talking about controlling the congestion. When you are trying, talking about avoiding the congestion, that means you are talking about some kind of a scheduled fabric and et cetera, et cetera, with other vendors are using it, right? And a uh, few vendors are using it, I would say. In scheduling a fabric, we are having a virtual output queue. You will hold that RDMA traffic. You look for the spray. All the links are perfect. And uh, we'll get the grant. Then we'll spray the traffic. The catch is the holding the traffic and holding the queue. I mean, the, you need a big queue. That means you need deep buffer, right? And also that what we are talking about, con controlling the congestion means look at the traffic on live. And if you feel the congestion, enable the ECN bits and in the endpoints and using the PFC to do that, uh, the pause frames and control the flow. Uh, we, we, we felt this will be the best options. And um, uh, I, I, we have a lab at, at, at our office and in our, uh, in our company. And we have done a kind of a lot of combination of testing and we are seeing a good results here. That's what I can say. And uh, yeah. yeah, we have only seven minutes. Yeah, exactly. So we'll go to these two mechanisms, uh, the only thing we want to highlight uh, yeah. as well is that they can be enabled at the per queue level, right? So based on the uh, buffers you have on the switches, let's say for the Super Spine 2, you may have, let's say, 128 megabytes of buffer. And then based on that, you will decide, okay, if uh, I'm running my LLM uh, model on specific queue, and this LLM is uh, very important because it's run, I don't know, for maybe for some uh, governmental agencies or for some financials, then I will decide, okay, to put a little bit more of the buffers and then trigger with lower probability all these pushbacks, right? So it's important to know that it's enabled at the per queue level. So, okay, these congestion me uh, mechanisms are important, but uh, it's actually better to consider some of the load balancing efficiency to actually avoid all this uh, congestion management because actually congestion management is that the, the, the problem occurred already and we need to handle this. In order to avoid the problem of congestion, we need an efficient load balancing inside the, the backend uh, AIDC. And so we have a first uh, example of the packet spraying where you, you see that we have three datagrams and then the first datagram of uh, 1500 bytes is split inside the switch on six uh, cells of 254 bytes. This is quite a typical approach for uh, uh, well the leading uh, uh, chip provider on the market of the data centers that we split the, the, the packet coming on the, on the ingress port to multiple cells. They are leveraged inside the, uh, the pipeline of the switch and only at the egress uh, buffer, they are reassembled and pushed, back, pushed on the wire, right? So each of these cell gets also a, a metadata information 
about the, uh, uh, the, the Q IDs as well as the lossless uh, characteristics, right? So inside the switch on the pipeline, there is some processing that happens, but the objective of this slide is to say that uh, if you have a three datagrams and you run the packet spraying, each of these 1500 bytes will go on different ports in order to efficiently use the outgoing interfaces based on the information of the bandwidth utilization already present on that switch, right? So if, for example, uh, the, the port three on the, on the switch was highly used by some other uh, uh, LLM, then uh, in this case, only port one and two would be used uh, in case of the, of the, of the packet spraying, right? And then we have the, the second mechanism, which is the flow-based. Uh, we may have situations where uh, uh, our NIC card on the server is not tolerating uh, uh, the reordering of the packets on the driver itself for specific type of uh, operations of the Rocky V2. So in this case, we may enable for specific operations only uh, the, the, the flowlet mode and then deliver uh, the packets in order across the fabric. So in this case, with that mechanism of the dynamic load balancing, the reordering won't happen, right? Yeah. And then the last one uh, we want to highlight is, is the selective load balancing where in fact we decide based on the type of operation, uh, either read, write, send, receive, then we will decide what kind of load balancing we'll be using, either the flow-based or the per packet, packet spraying, right? So this is uh, uh, possible as well, based on some firewall filters. And then the next one is uh, a situation where we, we are not only tracking the bandwidth used locally on the switch, but we also actually track the, uh, the, the bandwidth utilization and the congestions on the next to next hop, right? You can see that uh, on the spine, uh, for example, the link X1, uh, in case this one is, is becoming congested, congested, then the spines will inform the leaf devices that there is a congestion situation and the leaf will incorporate that information to decide on which of the outgoing links to send the packets. Yeah. So some form of uh, uh, traffic engineering will happen, but it will happen at the microsecond level. This is the key to remember that comparing to the traditional routing uh, uh, context, we are reacting here at the microsecond level and not at the, at the millisecond or second level, right? So you can see that there are two tables on the switch on the tour one that will be built, the, the local quality table, as well as the remote called next to next hub quality table will uh, incorporate the information on the neighbor state. And only then the tour device will decide either to send the packets on ABC links or maybe only on the BC to the destination tour four. All right. So that path quality is a new thing where we, uh, where we, we actually track not only the local uh, bandwidth utilization, but also of, of, of the neighbor, right? So this is just a, uh, just a, a visualization of uh, different load balancing mechanisms. You have at the bottom the static load balancing, which is just hash based, uh, uh, source desk UDP based. This is basic. We know that for the last uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, and then you have the dynamic load balancing, and then you have the global load balancing where you track your, your neighbor links utilization. And then you have, of course, the, uh, the DLB where we decide on the type of operations uh, for which type of DLB will be used. Hey, I would like to add one point. We have only two minutes to ask yeah. the question, but go back to the slide. So uh, out of this, SLB will not work uh, because that it will look for the entropy, but it will not work the look for the link utilization and the queue depth. So the only possibility is the GLB or the uh, dynamic load balancing. And, uh, and uh, in the Rocky V2 side, uh, DC, uh, that uh, PFC, SFS, EC, ECN, that's very important to do the control the congestion. Control. These are the two very key ingredient to build the lossless fabric, right, Mikkel? And you want to go through that or you have any questions? No, I, that, right? Yeah, exactly. We'll take the questions just in a, in, a, in a second. So just wanted to highlight at the very end that there is obviously a routing discussion that needs to happen, right? We are all here big fans of the BGP or of other uh, routing protocols such as the IGPs. They are also part of the, of the uh, backend fabric for the AIDC. So uh, for the front end, Mahesh mentioned at the beginning, right? It's nothing new. We will use the underlay overlay in order to deliver the multi-tenancy and then uh, monetize the, uh, the, the, the deployed learning model on the front end. But in the backend, it's usually deployed as, a, as just an underlay. There is no real uh, need uh, uh, to consider uh, necessarily the, the overlays. Uh, uh, one reason is that, well, we, we can get a little bit better latencies uh, for these GPUs, but also uh, that, uh, well, there is a, 
there's, there's no real need uh, to actually enable uh, multiple contexts on the routing side. But there are other options as well, and uh, I will talk about this uh, in a second with, uh, with the IGPs, which of course have different characteristics comparing to the, to, the, to the BGP. So what kind of BGP is used? Is the BGP unnumbered RFC 5549? Uh, that's something that is pretty common in case of uh, data center. It helps to automate uh, the deployments. So leaf to spine will establish their uh, BGP peerings based on the IPv6 uh, link local address addresses being exchanged at the link level. And then the ASN uh, allocations will happen uh, also by either at the automate level or, or, or by, the, by the admin itself. What I want to highlight is that sometimes these uh, networks are connected also to the core and then we will be using something called the BGP com community for the, uh, for the bandwidth. So if we have uh, a diversity of the bandwidth uh, when connecting to the core, then for the, the specific destination prefix, uh, the fabric will get actually not only the information about the prefix, but also about uh, what's the bandwidth uh, to reach that destination. And in this case, inside of using uh, uh, just the IP CMP, we'll use the unequal cost load balancing when, uh, when we want to reach the core IP networks. And then the very last point uh, is that uh, BGP may not necessarily have the awareness about the topology. Uh, same goes for the link, right? We talked about the community, but uh, the, the, at the link level, the IGPs has the native capability of, of knowing what are the links in the topology, what are the links in the specific group of devices, right? So that IGP protocol called Rift uh, has the, 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 at the top of the fabric, the top level, has the um, awareness what's the topology look like in the group and how to connect to the other groups, to the other pods of the data center. But, so that's something we also believe is important, especially if you would like to deploy something called the dragonfly type of topology. And so the incarnation of the dragonfly, the very simple one you can see on, on the diagram here, but actually the definitions of Time dragonflies are, are really up, yeah. uh, more, uh, uh, more advanced. So key takeaways, uh, so we have uh, uh, a lot of applications that can be uh, uh, used in the AIDC context. Different uh, large language models are uh, currently evolving. So we have large language models, small language models, so that applications are driving really the deployments. Dedicated DC infrastructure that the second point with 400, 800 giga uh, uh, increasing thanks to these uh, application deployments. And then the last point we covered during this session, congestion management and uh, the load balancing. These are the key two topics uh, for the AIDC context. So thank you so much for your attention. And uh, please, if you have any questions, we are here. Uh, happy to answer. Yeah.